All right, folks, I guess we'll take care of some housekeeping, but thank you for joining us for today's podcast, Optimizing IT for Hybrid Work. All right, now before we get started and while folks joining up, I do have a couple of housekeeping notes about Zoom for this event. First, you can change your audio settings from the audio settings menu. If you have trouble with the audio, you can switch between computer audio and phone call to get a dial-in number. Please use the Q&A section to ask us questions or if you'd like more detail on a topic. We've got a few others here that can answer your questions directly by chat throughout the event. We'll also take some questions live at the end. All right, with that out of the way, let's get things started. Now, before going straight into our agenda, I would like to introduce today's hosts. We got Adam Edwards, who is AppNet's Chief Customer Officer and is responsible for customer success, services, and support. Welcome, Adam. Thank you, Paul. Great to be with you today. Awesome. And then we got John Tuvik, who is AppNet's Director of Global Alliances. With a background in network technology and a passion for solving problems, he gets to do both every day here at AppNet. Welcome, John. Hi, Paul. Glad to be here. Very excited. Awesome. And again, I breezed right over my intro, but I am Paul Davenport. I am our Senior Marketing Communications Manager, and I will be moderating us today. Now, while today is going to be an open conversation, we're going to aim to tackle these following themes right here. But before we dive into the meat of the discussion, I know that John wanted to give a fair warning to the audience. So John, passing it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. We're so appreciative of everybody's time that they've taken out of their schedule to join on an IT webinar. Uh, we are going to play a bit of IT webinar bingo because you're going to hear some buzzwords. And so I'm going to apologize. We're all apologetic for that in advance. We're going to ask that you bear with us because some of these concepts, things like work from home, things like zero trust, which is absolutely a hot topic in everybody's inbox today, uh, it's on everybody's mind. And it's the content that everybody is receiving right now and being inundated with a lot of these buzzwords. But we always look at it from the perspective of end user experience and network delivery. So these very highly contextual things uh, have real implications to end user experience and network delivery. So we're always going to be taking that viewpoint. So thanks and bearing with us. You will hear some of the slang and jargon on today's call. All right. Okay, guys. Well, to set the scene, let's dive right in. Let's talk about hybrid work. Were people using this term a few years ago? And did it have the same meaning pre-pandemic that it has today? Let's unpack that. Interesting to hear the word hybrid, Paul. Uh, we didn't really hear it that often in the before time. It's most often used to describe the future of work. Uh, but I don't think the definition of it has changed that much from then to now. Uh, we'll talk about that a lot here in the next uh, minute or two. Uh, we've always had productivity workers. These are your users at distributed offices that are typically well managed. Uh, they're accessing applications that are traditionally delivered from your on-prem data center. And in recent years, those have migrated and found their way up to third-party SaaS or the cloud, whether that's Azure or AWS. And then to connect them uh, all together, the apps to the users, uh, these are typically or have been well-managed corporate networks. Uh, think MPLS backhaul, uh, or to some extent, uh, VPN, where you've had the small cohorts of transient users who might be working from home one day a week, or they're traveling, they need to get something done for quarter end and on their vacation, or they're in a Starbucks. So um, we've had this definition of hybrid work for, for some time. Yeah, and I would say from a user perspective, when you think about it, the user's experience of this, generally networks that deliver the applications and where applications live has been mostly invisible to the user, especially in the context of working from office. You know, IT has already done cloud migrations. They have history of using um, both data center, you know, kind of traditional data center delivered applications as well as cloud delivery applications. And from a user perspective, that's mostly invisible. The difference being that when a user was remote, they absolutely knew there was something different about getting access to their application. You know, they, they would have to go do something, have to turn on their VPN, they'd have to make some kind of change. And there would be some kind of expectation change around how that application was being delivered. And to some extent, the experience of that application as well. And so I think that's the thing that's also blurring from a user expectation standpoint is that now that needs to be much more seamless, whether they're in the office or working remotely, there isn't this conscious kind of change of how an application is gonna be delivered. And to, to bring that invisibility, you know, IT always did a really good job. So think of IT as in the middle, knitting everyone together, being central to ensuring users can access the core services from wherever they were. 
And if that ever wasn't the case, IT had SLAs, they had the service providers and the application providers and owners on speed dial, and they could get things fixed really quickly when issues arose with user experience. Uh, I think what, what's really changed other than well, the, the very definition of hybrid hasn't, but I think the components and the key actors here have. So we're gonna look forward here in the next few minutes today and talk about what's happening as you've put more distance in between IT, the users, the apps and connections. Um, and that's happened. So all these actors have moved outside the well-managed four walls of the corporate network and infrastructure that you've had your hands on. Uh, and a lot of that's happened all at once in the last year and a half. So We've just, all been thinking yeah. about cloud-based delivery of applications. And when we were reflecting on getting ready for this, you know, thinking about what hybrid was, one of the applications that actually came to mind for me was VDI. I couldn't help but think about VDI as being one of those technologies that actually almost had it right for delivering applications to anywhere at any time. But I really feel like when VDI was deployed years ago, there was still something not really uh, kind of aligned with the any application anywhere. There was still something different around how you access VDI environments. Like maybe you still turn on a VPN to get there and it didn't quite feel as seamless uh, as it could have or should have because it was right there. It had all the right kind of look and feel of, of a next generation type of delivery of an application. But what's been really interesting over the last year, I feel like, you know, we've said this is the year of VDI. I don't know how many times. There's been a really strong comeback of VDI over the last year, and it truly has been delivered in a more anywhere at any time type of context, I think more than ever before. And so I don't know if this is the year or next year is going to be the year of a breakout VDI. And I don't know how many times we've said that or thought that over the last several years, but that one truly feels like one of those hybrid things that almost had it right and for sure is kind of coming into its own over the last year. So mental note, breaking news, this will be the year of VDI. <laughs> right, this is the year. <laughs> so if we think about how we'd connect to an application like VDI, the service delivery network and chain has grown a lot more complex. Um, just think about the last mile for a moment. Uh, I, I heard a, a story the other day about a, a user trying to connect to an app hosted in Azure. Um, and they were connecting over their last mile, which was a residential broadband circuit powered by Xfinity. Uh, and their in-home network was a single access point hotspot. So no Wi-Fi mesh, nothing well managed, and the user expectations being as high as ever today, I want this right now, uh, and the actual outcome of IT having to troubleshoot that situation, really challenging. In fact, that's just one use case, but we wanted to learn how the the greater knowledge base, uh, knowledge workers are affected. So we put out a survey of over a thousand um, productivity workers in uh, North America recently. And we asked them about what their work from home challenges were. These are users who depended on their last mile internet provider to do work. Uh, and I think many of you probably would, would be very familiar with all of these issues, if not many of them. Slow loading times for websites. You know, who here has ever had a call or their own experience when the app is slow, right? It happens probably more times than, uh, than you care to admit. Video calls freezing. Uh, I was on a, a webinar. I had numbers two and three converge for me about six months ago. I was hosting a webinar and my last mile ISP flickered and I lost a session mid-sentence. Um, that was kind of awkward, uh, but that happens. So there you have video calls freezing, sometimes as a result of brownouts or an outright outage of service. Issues with the ISP, streaming content, and a lot of other ancillary challenges. Uh, I think one of the takeaways here is that user productivity suffers when any one of these happen. And if we'd taken the survey, say two, even three years ago, uh, for corporate offices who depend on their, their last mile internet provider from a remote site to do their work, you would have seen a lot less incidents uh, of these and other related issues. So while hybrid work is similar in theory between today and a couple of years ago, the scale of each actor, um, whether it's user, application, connectivity, uh, has changed over time from being within the four walls of the well-managed enterprise to being without. Gotcha. Okay, so thinking back to that IT diagram we looked at earlier, with so little managed infrastructure sitting in the middle with IT today, can we unpack what considerations IT should be looking at for the new hybrid cloud reality? And how have those evolved since the start of the pandemic? 
Yeah. Uh, so other than be afraid. <laughs> so we, we have here users, we check out the next slide, we'll revisit our diagram as, it, as it's changing. Um, you have users now operating from anywhere alongside, that's the hybrid part, alongside your users in the corporate offices as they return. Uh, you've got your apps. Um, we heard on our recent customer advisory board that many of our customers told us, I really wish I could go back to my two-year-old self, two-year-ago self, and finish that cloud migration, finish that SaaS deployment. Um, yeah, I, I came up short. So you've, you've got the, uh, I guess the culmination of all of those apps moving outside of the on-prem data center. And then the connections are no longer on-prem. So IT here has a much greater distance between itself, the accountability, the management control. Well, I'll say the management control at least uh, and the ownership of these assets in the service delivery chain, given this new normal. Yeah, absolutely. If you think about this diagram, especially the network, I feel like that circle should be even further away <laughs> from IT because that has been the challenge of delivering any application to anywhere at any time over the last year. We've encountered transformations that basically mean an application is being delivered across the network from the cloud, not touching any IT infrastructure that is owned whatsoever. You know, a good example of that is Microsoft Teams. We're seeing kind of a split tunnel internet offload directly to Microsoft Teams, means, meaning we're going right from the user's internet directly into the Microsoft network. No part of that is managed by IT, but they absolutely need to have the visibility and understand what end user experience of that connectivity looks like. And also just really simple things. You know, we, we talk about struggles that IT had visibility wise for users over the last year, answering a very simple question like, is this user on Wi-Fi? You know, that, that's something that sounds so trivial and yet has such a uh, meaningful impact and user experience and delivery and all the things that are going to come with trying to provide the best experience to those users, including being able to help them when something goes wrong. Yeah, and I think with, with IT in the middle here, with everything else pushed so far away from a control standpoint, if you've got to troubleshoot that, that situation with a user one user on Microsoft Teams with an Xfinity connection and an in-home Wi-Fi network. Um, if it's not mesh, it's probably meh from a Wi-Fi performance and user experience standpoint. If you're IT and you've got to find that needle in which haystack and you've got a schedule to keep, you're in the middle. And you left probably wondering, if, I know if I were in those same shoes is what I hear every day, you're thinking probably, how am I gonna work till Friday or WTF? That's a, a tough <laughs> position to be in. Then when you blow that on a scale at hundreds or thousands of users and locations. Um, I have to be impressed. I'm very impressed with Mesh Not Mad. Did you make that up? Because I am impressed with that Wi-Fi terminology. I'm absolutely stealing that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> All right. Awesome. So alluding back to that bingo card we looked at back at the beginning here, can we discuss some of the security considerations for hybrid work and what IT teams are up against today? Yeah, we have to say zero trust uh, in this webinar. Sorry for the bingo, but this is a very real, uh, very real context that we're that IT is up against. I mean, security is so paramount. The concerns around security is growing. The strategies around zero trust is growing, which is really all about any application anywhere at any time and making sure your security posture can support that. Of course, we're seeing more unmanaged devices, especially in the context of that VDI piece I was mentioning earlier. You've got third-party contractors that might be your contact center agents, and they're bringing unmanaged devices into the environment. Obviously, over the last year, you've probably shipped hundreds, if not thousands of laptops to new employees as, of, as they've started, and their experience of application delivery is going to be shifting from wherever they were on some unmanaged network back into the corporate office. Your security posture has been all about trying to support that zero trust kind of mandate. And uh, there's going to be challenges. There's going to be trade-offs between end user experience and the security posture that you have. I mean, I even think of our own director of IT, Jason, who has to manage this at a small scale. We're, we're not a monster company with tens of thousands of employees, but Jason's encountering this. And you were talking to him last week, Adam, about you know what he was in encompassing with laptops as well. Yeah, I had my own um, uh, new user story with, uh, with our IT support team recently. I, uh, we did a mid-year a mid laptop refresh um, 
uh, about this time in the pandemic a year ago. And my laptop's been working great. Uh, I operate on Wi-Fi here and at other places and have traveled and it's, it's, been, um, it's been faultless. Uh, I stopped by the office to do some work recently and I couldn't get online. You know, zero trust to kind of zero connectivity for me, unfortunately. So it was only in a conversation where I'd reminded that this was a, a recent uh, laptop where we realized that the MAC address hadn't been entered in that facility's uh, Wi Fi authentication mechanism yet. So once we did that, I was back and running, but it took a support call and uh, a QA. And, you know, we've got two relatively uh, IT savvy people participating in that, uh, which is not always a luxury that, uh, that we have. Um, I guess a related story of zero trust causing some issues. Uh, one of our large hospitality customers uh, is redeploying uh, new routers, refreshing their routers for WAN connectivity and back office functions at several hundred locations. And they're taking advantage of that onsite to deploy uh, the AppNet or monitoring point, uh, point to that. Now deploying AppNet is really easy. You get an IP address from DHCP, you plug it into a LAN port and it connects and then all the rest is done really easily. Um, so. Uh, we had the monitoring point, was deployed on the configuration bench the night before, connected, updated, ready for monitoring, and it didn't connect. And, you know, we were left there scratching our head, doing some diagnostics. Then we called into the provider's uh, IT department, only to learn that the network access control had not been completed for that device at that site yet. So you can't just go plug in a new client on a LAN. So good news is that provider's thinking about security. Bad news is that cause it just causes additional friction with almost every application or uh, monitoring point or deployment that you would have there. So that's a, a zero to one or up and down situation. Um, but we all know there's a lot of room between up and down. And when you think about the multiple layers of security, privacy, and trust that have to work well for users to have valid experience, uh, it's important that you monitor through that end to end security and delivery network to see how that user is being supported. The IT organization is absolutely going to need to make a compromise and make a trade to manage risk and to have a strong security posture. You know, a, a big cloud provider customer of ours comes to mind where from the top down, they have a mandate that they absolutely will sacrifice end user experience for the sake of security. And that makes sense. The challenge I, I think that we're faced with now is to really assess how big is that risk? What is the impact of productivity? What is the impact end user experience really going to look like when you go ahead and make that change and make that trade um, for security, which of course is a priority in, on everybody's mind um, in today's day and age. The other thing that I think is interesting when we talk about network delivery and unmanaged networks is that zero trust component is going to extend to understanding how your application traffic is being delivered. How is it getting from point A to point B? I think of also a, a customer of ours who is a location services provider. They have a multi-cloud environment for which they deliver their applications and they absolutely need to understand how applications are being routed over the internet. They have to understand what regions it crosses that has implications around compliance. They have to understand what countries it goes through that has implications of compliance. So that visibility becomes more and more paramount. And speaking about, you know, sort of regional requirements, Adam, you heard this at the VCAB, how really even on a regional basis, this can have pretty significant implications. Yeah, we, um, uh, we ourselves added some great capabilities uh, on our workstation native monitoring point recently to help understand the, connect the connection type. Is it VPN? Is it not? Is it wired? Is it wireless? And then you know, coming soon will be certain host-based performance indicators so that they can be part of your holistic um, troubleshooting and diagnostic conversation between IT and a user. Uh, when we talked about that, got our VCAB members really excited. These are our customers who are advising our roadmap and strategy. Uh, but we got uh, some really interesting feedback on regional specific privacy and compliance considerations that those features need to be able to be granular per region. You can't collect the same set of information from a global organization uh, depending on one region versus another. So you've got to be really thoughtful so as if we needed anything more complex in our lives when it came to understanding the last mile and the last 50 feet, uh, but it's out there, so. Yeah, and I think this is going to get more challenging. You know, that same survey, the future of internet outlook is 
is talking about sort of the expectations of where everyone thinks this is going. You know, just like you want to have electricity, just like you want to have running water, people want internet as a public utility. They want more and more access to public Wi-Fi. You know, if you go downtown, how many public Wi-Fi spots are available where you could be accessing applications? Not to mention the rise of 5G, which is going to basically allow your customers to connect from anywhere, which is more of that any app anywhere at any time. This visibility of how your applications actually traverse the network is going to become more and more imperative because it has such a serious consequence, not only on that compliance that we've been talking about, but obviously end user experience as well. All right. Okay, so with all these changes and all these considerations at play, let's get to the action items. So where should IT teams begin in mapping out their hybrid work network optimization? Well, you should get started now. Uh, it's a great time to build your uh, pre-flight checklist, right? Before you hop behind the, the yoke and pull up, you, you want to have uh, everything you need to uh, cared for. So speaking of time, I just wanted to share that you know one of the, the wins we've seen through the pandemic is IT's ability to shine as an agile, responsive organization to the business. Um, we were all kind of put through the crucible here in a short number of weeks, about a year and a half back. And we had to go through the complete transformations that were in flight at the time. Uh, and I think in a way, IT will become a victim of its own success because it's demonstrated the new normal is the ability to react quickly and complete these really complex transitions that used to take months and years, often in weeks. So there's that new baseline. Yeah, that agility now, that's going to happen. I think that's going to be built into the DNA of delivering applications from here on out is that that agility was demonstrated in the last year, like, like at no other time, you know, we're talking about huge business transformation happening really rapidly. We were talking to a customer who did a Microsoft teams, complete Microsoft teams transformation, uh, that used to, you know, would have been a plan for six to eight months, did it in two months. And that was, you know, kind of top to bottom. And so that's, you know, a breakneck pace to perform that transformation. And as you said, Adam, a victim of your own success, that might be the new baseline in terms of the agility you need to be able to drive transformation. Hard to go back once you've set the new standard, right? Yeah, exactly right. Well, let's talk about the, I guess, the first order of business, right? Everything that we do is customer and user centric. And I think that's a, always a golden rule in, uh, in the IT profession. So how do you assess your user footprint to understand what you'll need to be on the hook for to deliver as those doors to the offices open back up in the coming weeks and months? So take stock of your in-office and remote user footprint, get your own lay of the land. Certainly you can go read the Wall Street Journal reports and McKinsey surveys and understand what percentage of workers in a certain um, uh, industry would be comfortable with coming back to the office, but nothing is as good and real and contextual than talking to your people operations, listening to your corporate policies about return to work and when and what that looks like. Uh, and then using that to map out the capacity, the infrastructure, the IT support, the apps and all the other things that are headquartered around reliably reliably delivering your services uh, to your users. Yeah, and a, a seemingly innocuous ask, a seemingly innocent ask as the next step is to really understand your application landscape. I mean, it sounds like an easy thing to answer, but actually it has some complexity to it because as IT, you're of course going to know what those three, four top critical applications are going to be because everybody in the business uses them. But on a business unit by business unit standpoint, I think there's going to be a lot of variability as to what those key enterprise applications are going to be. And if we think about the last year, I'm sure that application landscape has changed and not to play more IT bingo, but there's going to be some shadow IT in there where business units are subscribing to critical services that they need to do their job. I mean, on a personal level, I can't tell you how many new subscriptions I've started over the last year. I think the same is going to be true for applications that are being used to do the business, especially in the context of SaaS applications and cloud-based applications as they were being accessed from anywhere. And we, you really need to have a full accounting of what that is because that will have very specific implications of your future designs of how applications are going to be delivered. If you're thinking about SD-WAN, you really need to understand what's on the wire as you are making design decisions around how those applications are going to be delivered. And I think one, one thought to add there, if you have a corporate delivered SaaS app uh, like Teams, 
chances are pretty good that that vendor has thought about what the performance imperatives are for that app. They don't know what network or what office or what equipment you'll be delivering it over, but chances are good that if you looked for it, you'll understand what capacity you need per session, the latency loss jitter, think quality of experience for MOS uh, that you'll, you'll need to, to guarantee reliable app delivery. So we're starting to see more and more of those. And those are often the first places we help our customers look when it comes to calibrating their app net deployment. But what alert thresholds do I need? Well, let's talk about what your business critical apps are. Um, speaking of SLAs and app delivery, um, your best gold standard is still probably lying in the SLAs of your well-managed corporate MPLS circuits or your carrier delivered WANs. Um, those offices have likely been idle for quite some time. A lot of people don't realize that they likely have uh, well-constructed uh, SLA documents that govern things like uptime and capacity and latency loss jitter. And even more importantly, when something goes wrong, what's your response time or turnaround time and how do you engage that, that machine? So take a look at those SLAs, be familiar with them, and then understand if they're being met today. We help customers very often uh, in some cases, implicate their providers and substandard delivery against SLAs. And then there's the need to validate once those SLAs are actually being met again. Absolutely. Now is the best time to measure how well those WAN and, and internet connectivity uh, circuits are performing because it is never going to get more empty than it is right now. And if it's bad now, you can bet that it's going to absolutely be much worse when there's a demand on it as people start moving back to office or continue the hybrid use of the office um, over time. And you know, similar to that, as you're measuring not only the WAN, but end to end through all the infrastructure you own and control, we knew at the beginning of this thing that one of the first sort of internal infrastructure to get underwater was VPN concentrators. As everybody went to home, VPN concentrators were completely underwater. What is that going to look like when everybody comes back, what's that piece of office infrastructure that will be underwater when their new demands are met? Is that going to be the wireless? Is it going to be your gateway? Is it going to be a concentrator? What is that going to be? Uh, what, what new challenge are you going to have just based on the infrastructure you do own and control? So you do have to be thinking about not just measuring the WAN, but measuring end to end. Sure. And certainly as part of that, if you've got an equipment upgrade scheduled, uh, do it. Um, and do it before you need it. Uh, we had a, another hospitality provider that did a, I'll say a multi-hundred site router firmware upgrade uh, over the 4th of July weekend or just before it. This is one of the peak demand seasons at their properties uh, of, the, of the year, uh, certainly of the last year. And uh, that didn't go so well. So they actually started having problems coincident with the end of that software upgrade with their core back office applications. And they happened to be using AppNeta at the time to see the before and after. So they saw incidents of intermittent packet loss starting to happen when those networks and properties got busier with more concurrency from an application standpoint. So they were able to grab a capture, share the forensic details with the software uh, an equipment vendor, and then roll back the firmware of those affected devices. And they're waiting for a revised load to be able to roll that out with better confidence. So best time to do that is before you need it. Uh, then you can watch the before, the during, and the after to make sure you're ready for what's next. Absolutely. And we've talked a lot about SLAs, but the last thing on, on this uh, sort of page here is, is back to SLAs. But what are your SLAs? What are the enterprise IT SLAs back to your user community? Whether they be working remote, whether they be working from a corporate office, this is something that needs to be well-defined. And over the last year, with all the struggles of insight and visibility that enterprise IT had, we really thought that was going to lead to a rise of more significant investment in a connectivity policy. What does connectivity really need to look like to be able to successfully deliver applications? This is how you're going to hold yourself accountable, but this is also how you're going to inform the business as to whether or not you can support the hybrid work environments, the work from anywhere environments, um, is through your own definition of delivering applications and your own SLAs. If you're not thinking about that, uh, you should dust that off because those are going to need to go through some changes. And speaking of delivering insight to business, um, we know that we're not the only monitoring stack in IT. We weren't the first. When you think about what it takes to deliver accountability for SLAs, those are typically in the form of reports 
And those reports have to be consumable by non-network engineers. So these aren't people that are going to be troubleshooting. These are the people that will be making decisions and are accountable to other aspects of the business for IT performance and infrastructure and, and app delivery. So um, recognizing that there are multiple tools, some of those have probably been idle. I don't know if your SNMP on-prem uh, or NetFlow have been that busy in the last few months. Um, those are likely to get busier. You should be thinking about holistically, what are your chosen tools for SLA reporting to the business for things like uptime, reliable user experience delivery? Has that met your standards on a per app, per region, per carrier, or some other tagged basis? Uh, and what are those tools that you'll use to do that? You'll probably find that there's an overlap in tools and likely you'll be asked to start rationalizing what you really need in this modern hybrid work era, uh, where you've got users outside of the traditional purview of a lot of the tools that you might have found comforting a couple of years back. So we're actually pretty used to working with customers and helping them answer those questions. How do I rationalize my monitoring stack investment? And uh, we're happy to help. Yeah, and you know, that's interesting too, the point you made, like I really think as well, you have to make sure your tooling stack or your tooling ecosystem takes into account the ability to measure, manage any app, anywhere, anytime. Like it has to fit that mandate of how applications are going to be delivered. But that's a really good point. It can't just be about the tactical or reactive data too. You have to be looking at this information in a through a strategic lens to actually inform the business. You want to be a partner to the business that says, we are ready for this or we are not ready for this and we need to make an investment. I think we have to go back to our bingo board and add business partner somewhere. Business partner. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, noted. Okay. Well, thank you very much, guys. That was a wonderful checklist. I did want to open it up to the room for any questions. And we got a couple, just a moment. Okay. First one. If there is an autumn spike in COVID, what can IT do to prepare for another shift to full remote? <coughs> Vaccine. <coughs> You Excuse have me. to be, uh, yeah, right. You have to be, you know, you have to be ready to deliver again. We talked about uh, being a victim of your own success of how quickly you made a transformation. So likely since you've just been through that, not that long ago, you're probably ready to do it again. You know, the thing that I think we just touched on is going to be your most important asset is that connectivity policy, because now it's not so much about, can you do it? You've already proven you can make a transformation quickly. You've already proven that you can deliver any application to anywhere. But IT needs some tools to defend whether or not they can be successful at it. That's the, that's the new measure. It's not whether they can do it. It's can they measure if they've been successful. So they need a remote connectivity policy. They need a policy that suggests this is what you need to be able to be successful in consuming these applications. And I, that's why I think that's a really important thing to be thinking about, not only in case that spike happens, but just in general, that's the new measure of success. Yeah, just, just to add, I, I just say, sharpen your stack and get the visibility you need in place now to make sure you have eyes on the user experience of your offsite and onsite workers together. Awesome. Okay. Sharpen your stack. I like that a lot. <laughs> Sharpen All your right. stack. We got another one here for you. I think you guys touched on this one a little bit. So it might be re-expanding on some points from earlier, but how can you get visibility if you don't have an agent on a device, i.e. if an employee is working from a personal laptop? Right. Well, we always try to make the recommendation that the best thing to be measuring from is absolutely to be measuring from as close to the user as possible. So, you know, we've always tried to make it very, very lightweight, very, very easy to get our agent that would actually run from that perspective um, and make that very easy to deploy at scale, whether that's through SCOM and it's deployed silently, or that agent is delivered through some third party, which is also possible and installed silently. You know, you, we don't necessarily want the user to have to be involved in having that take place and having that visibility. It's always best to be measuring from that perspective, if possible. Now, sometimes it's not possible. So you have to really be thinking about ways in which you can have a proxy for that performance that you understand. Again, we talked about the office as the golden baseline of performance, because if it's not good there, it's not going to be good for the majority of your users. You have to be thinking about if I can't get right onto the user's machine, what's my proxy for that? You know, a lot of the times it's going to be your office is the gold standard and baseline of performance anyway. Gotcha. All right. Okay. Let's get one more question in. 
Can you give some specific examples of tools or apps that you think won't survive the shift to hybrid work? I think some of the on-prem systems seem like a low-hanging fruit answer here, but want to expand on that a little bit, guys? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. I, I think the relevance of certain on-prem monitoring stack components uh, certainly will be uh, reduced over mm -hmm. more modern cloud-ready infrastructure agnostic monitoring. So your traditional trusty dusty SNMP or NetFlow solution, um, you may still use it. You'll always have on-prem infrastructure to manage, but they're not gonna give you kind of the synthetic or active and passive user experience monitoring, nor the underlying uh, actual path delivery uh, that's traversing third-party services. Uh, they're just not capable of that. So I don't think this is a dinosaur and comet situation where, <laughs> the, where they go away altogether, but I think certainly you'll see this new class of the monitoring stack rise and the prominence of those old trusty standbys decline. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I like that analogy too, because like what was a T-Rex um, is now going to be uh, a chameleon. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the amount that you relied on it, uh, because honestly, you're using less and less of your own managed infrastructure to, to deliver applications. So tooling that's all about your own infrastructure is going to have to basically shrink it in the same context. You know, you're shrinking how much infrastructure you want to manage. Therefore, you're going to shrink the amount of tooling that you have that's focused on that one job. So I agree with you. I don't think it's going to zero, but I think we're going to see kind of diminished consumption of that and an expanded consumption of those tools that can provide visibility one end to end and is really mapping and adhering to that any app, anywhere, anytime type of mantra that you've got to be thinking about when delivering applications. Got it. All right. Well, guys, I think that's all we got for time today. Thank you both so much for joining us and giving us all these awesome takeaways. And thank you, everybody, for joining our event today. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. We, we hope you'll join us again. If you're interested in learning more about AppNeta or to dive a bit deeper in anything we've discussed today, please visit appneta.com slash blog or request a demo at appneta.com slash demo. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.